dare I say, the Orioles are elite. Anthony Castor Vince, as we say good morning to you, I feel like you've seen it all. So when you sent us a list of things that have surprised you so far, I said, we got to talk about it. First on your list, the Orioles becoming elite. I mean, I mean, I think the word elite is important because if any of us would have been asked in March, will they be at the top of the East? I don't know if we'd raise our hand, but here we are. What have you seen in Good Morning? Good morning, Lauren. Yeah, it's 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 elite without major additions last offseason. You know, they had a really nice year last year, took a huge step forward, and I anticipated, as did many, that they'd be a playoff contender this year. But to lead the AL East at this late stage in the game, I think it's a shock. Uh, I did hear from a couple of Orioles fans over email telling me, oh, no, everybody <laughs> from Cockeysville to Glen Burnie knew that this was an elite team. I'm like, I don't think so, because I heard from a lot of you before the season, and you were pretty bitter, that, uh, and understandably so, that, you know, Mike Elias is ready for liftoff comments going into free agency, and then they signed, you know, Kyle Gibson. And <laughs> I think a lot of us worried they'd be a little short on the pitching side, but, you know, to have a, a season like this, you got to have some pleasant surprises. You know, Yanir Cano goes from a freaking 11 ERA to one of the best relievers in baseball, and Ryan O'Hearn was pretty anonymous, anonymous, and he's been productive for them. Uh, Aaron Hicks was a nice pickup when Cedric Mullins was down, et cetera. Uh, Kyle Bradish has been like an ace for them uh, after an ERA near five last year. So, yeah, the O's are elite without, you know, the, the big ticket items. They did get Jack Flaherty at the trade deadline, but, um, you know, they had a very quiet offseason. Glenn Burning made me giggle, by the way. They're going nowhere. A lot of talent in the minor leagues as well. Okay, you didn't see the Marlins and the Reds as contenders. I think with Miami, we knew they were going to pitch it. I think with Cincinnati, none of us knew what the rookies were going to do. That's fair, right? Yeah, a lot of surprise teams in that NL playoff race. You know, the, the D-backs, the Cubs, and the Giants could probably apply for a lot of people as well. But, but to me, the, the Marlins and the Reds, I think, are the big shockers. Uh, the Reds going into the year from fan graphs had a 1.7% chance of reaching the uh, reaching the playoffs. And that, that's like Jim Carrey territory. You know, you're saying there's a chance, but they've taken advantage of some, you know, unexpected uh, impact from from the youth on their roster. Matt McClain, Spencer Steer, Will Benson was a nice pickup for them. T.J. Friedel and of course, Ellie David LaCruz, you know, gave them a jolt of electricity midseason. So I, whether or not they make the playoffs, I mean, they've surprised me offensively because I thought, if anything, they would be guided by Hunter Green, Graham Ashcraft, Nick Lodolo, that group at the top of the rotation. But Green and Lodolo dealt with injuries, and the rotation's been a weakness, actually. Uh, but the offense has really helped them a lot. And then the Marlins, you know, they had better odds than the Reds, but you just figure it's pretty crowded and at least going yeah. into the season uh, with the Braves, the Mets, uh, and the Phillies. And uh, you got to give credit to Kim Ong for, for a really great additions to that offense. You know, she made the trade for Lu Lu Luis Arias before the season. And uh, Josh Bell and Jake Berger here midseason have been instant offense for them. And so they've been a really fun team to watch to go with a you know, really fun young pitching staff. And Yuri Perez has come up and, and wowed us. So, um, again, maybe these teams don't don't have it in the home stretch and don't make it. But I think they've already surprised us. Yeah, and the future is so bright for both of them from the positive to the other side. All right, I have a list of teams. You said Yankees, Mets, Padres, Cardinals might all miss the playoffs. And that surprises you. You know, I was trying to think of of those teams that you gave, which is the most surprising. I don't know if I could pick one. What about you? Oh, man, I, I think the Padres, actually, because they're still surprising to me when you look at, you know, positive run differential. They just haven't gotten the job done in extra innings, 0-10. They're 6-19 and in one-run game. So, you know, it's still a pretty confounding team. Those other teams, Yankees, Mets, and Cardinals, I mean, you can kind of explain it away with the new rules, I think, where, you know, the Yankees are, are old and lumbering and relying on the home run, and the game's gotten more athletic. Uh, the Mets had an older rotation, and again, the game's gotten more athletic. It's sped up on them. And, uh, and the Cardinals, you know, with the defensive shift restrictions and going into the season with a ground ball, you know, non-strikeout staff, I think it really hurt them. So I guess I can explain it, but I think, you know, all four of those teams were very popular picks to not just make the playoffs, but win their divisions. You mentioned the new rules, Anthony. I'm looking at your list, and this one is my favorite. Pitch timer violations are <laughs> rare. I mean, truly, yeah. two weeks in, what we thought would have been the biggest story was a non-factor. Yeah, I, you know, I've been knee deep in these rule changes the last few years in terms of reporting and talking to people. And we had, you know, tons of minor league games and data to draw from. But this has surprised even me because now we're down to, if you watch a three game series, on average, you're seeing one violation in that three game series between the two teams. And to put that in perspective, I mean, there's fewer violations per game in MLB right now than there were in the minor leagues at the end of last season. So you would expect, you know, with more veterans in the mix and that sort of thing, and people who weren't accustomed to the time, we expect more adjustment or longer adjustment. But 
It's happened really fast, where it's dropped precipitously from the beginning of the year. And even at the beginning of the year, it wasn't, I don't think, as pronounced as some people feared. I think a lot of people worried that, you know, there's going to be a automatic ball or strike in just about uh, every inning, and it's going to be chaos. But it really wasn't. You know, we had the, the first month uh, in the, we had the month of spring training games as uh as a way to get settled in. And I think guys settled in pretty well. And, and now they're, they're rolling. Uh, yeah. A funny thing I heard the other day, Lauren was a, an older veteran pitcher, a name, you know, complaining to a younger pitcher, well, this, this pitch timer is the worst, man. I'm hyperventilating <laughs> out there. I'm out of breath. Isn't this terrible? And he wanted some the commiseration there. And the younger guy's like, actually, I kind of like it. He's so. like, I'm 21. <laughs> it's all well and good when you're 22 years right. old. Hey, are you surprised that Robert's going to race the freeze? Yes or no? Any tips? Uh, that is, I have no tips, whatever, except I just know he'll be hyperventilating like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Anthony Gaster events. You're the best. Good luck, my friend.